let's get started. So today um, we're going to be covering um, environmental DNA, uh, history and background, um, uh, the business that we're, we're working with, Nature Metrics, um, who they are and um, what eDNA is and how we can detect um, things with eDNA and um, eDNA horizons as well, what's on the horizon for, for eDNA. Um, before we go into all of that, um, we would like to, um, I'd like to introduce you um, to the uh, presenters that are going to be um, presenting for you today. Um, sorry, sorry about that. Um, so there's there's myself, um, Emma Hatchett. I've got 20 years of experience in ecological consultancy. Um, so I've seen extensive change in the methods used um, and uh, how we detect different um, it, things in our environments. I've worked for um, WSP and the UK team um, for over seven years, uh, first as a regional director in the Midlands and North of the UK, and now as deputy team leader for the UK national team. Uh, my experience is largely around UK protected species um, and uh, ha I've got an array, array of uh, consultancy experience within this area. I particularly specialised in licensing um, for bats and I've worked on a number of large infrastructure projects uh, including things like HS2 and, um, and other road and rail projects. Jo. Thank you Emma, can you hear me okay? Yes. That's a relief. Hi, my name is um, Joe Hoddart and I work for Nature Metrics as a uh, subject matter expert. Uh, like Emma, I've, I've, I've uh, got a bit of experience in the consultancy world. I did a little bit of work on the HS2 line um, a long time ago now. But uh, yeah, I, I, I really um, focused on uh, aquatic ecology in my academic career, working on trying to quantify the uh, ecological response to habitat restoration in chalk streams, which are very uh, rare ecosystems that we have here in the UK. And uh, I then moved on to do a postdoc looking at molecular approaches to get an idea of um, Colombian freshwater fish diversity. So, you know, mega diverse ecosystems that are logistically very challenging to do the kind of macroinvertebrate and fish surveys that we, that we do here in the UK. Um, I joined Nature Metrics a year and a half ago, and uh, it, it's been a really exciting journey and to see what we can do with this uh, with these tools. Thank you, Emma. Thanks, Joe. As I said, um, this is the agenda we're going to work through today. Um, now you've met Joe, he's going to be taking forward the Nature Metrics sections of um, of this agenda. Um, and before we move on to Joe's um, part, I'll talk a little bit about um, our relationship with Nature Metrics as well. So in terms of um, our projects at WSP, we look always to, um, to meet sustainable development goals within the delivery of those projects. Um, we do try as a business to meet these goals uh, regularly. Our projects also help to, to us to meet those goals as well. So you might see some little squares on some of our slides where we feel that these um, these goals are somewhat met by by those case studies or by the techniques that we're that we're looking to to use as well. So um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a potted history of um, the use of environmental DNA or eDNA for short in um, in the UK. So firstly, what is eDNA? Um, when an organism like a fish or uh, a newt moves through the environment, it is constantly shedding bits of itself dead skin cells, mucus, feces, all into the surrounding habitats. The DNA in the organic matter um, is known as environmental DNA. So if somebody tested a sample of water, these pieces of DNA could indicate the recent presence of the fish, newts, or other environment, um, other species within that water. Um, even if those species are not currently present or none of them are visually um, seen. So, in short, eDNA is everywhere and 
is changing as the environment changes around us. Um, so we can, as I said, we can see species that perhaps aren't present or are hard to detect within that environment. So once a species is sequenced, um, they can then be identified through this sampling method. And, and Joe's going to talk a little bit about that later. Um, within the UK, historically, most of that eDNA sampling has been done within the water environments. Great crested newts, if you've not seen one before, um, just uh, it, one of these at the top of the, um, of the screen here. Um, we've used those to detect presence um, or absence of great crested newts in water bodies. Great crested newts is one of um, our protected species in the UK. Um, and then we've also used eDNA to analyze uh, bat droppings uh, when we collect them in, um, in buildings and trees to determine what species might be roosting in that environment as well. More recently, um, we've used eDNA to uh, do water column sampling and look at fish and invertebrate presence within the water system, uh, rivers and freshwater. And we've also used in an innovative um, way, looking at uh, DNA um, dormouse nest nests as well to identify whether they were dormouse nests or indeed uh, belonging to a different species. So I've got a couple of case studies or examples of use of eDNA in the UK. This one is a project that we worked on in Lou Harbour in Cornwall. So Lou is um, down here at the um, very south coast of the UK. Um, it's one of the most flooded towns in England and is supported by two uh, rivers going into the harbour. Um, we were commissioned as a business to co design flood alleviation scheme for the town and that included ecological impact assessment. So the assessment for aquatics um, associated with the marine and freshwater environments. It, there were concerns about the impact um, that any flood barriers that were put into those rivers and off the harbour may have on migratory fish species, particularly Atlantic salmon in two rivers where this species was um, recovering. The assessment therefore needs to identify both the fish that were using the area, but also the distribution along the two rivers and uh, into, into the sea of this migratory species. So the issues that we encountered and why eDNA was used, um, there was health and safety risks around using electric fishing in the harbour. And there were also risks to migratory fish, the salmon, using nets and uh, their welfare when caught in the nets as well. So we combined a mix of traditional surveys, so the electric fishing surveys with eDNA surveys within both those freshwater and marine habitats. Um, electric fishing was used where possible, but there were safety concerns, as I mentioned, and also permits um, that may not have been uh, able to be gained through the Environment Agency and, and other agencies within the UK. The eDNA samples um, identified a range of fish presence, including haddock and Atlantic mackerel. If you are familiar with either of those species, then you'll know they are deep sea fish and therefore wouldn't be expected in the shallow, um, shallower waters towards the harbour of, um, of Lou and also near the, the rivers as they um, kicked out into the sea. Um, the electric fishing surveys did identify Atlantic salmon but they weren't picked up as part of the eDNA surveys. So we need to use our professional judgments as to why some species were there that we wouldn't expect and why other species were only picked up within the um, eDNA surveys rather than the uh, fishing surveys and vice versa. So we concluded that eDNA surveys were useful where other techniques weren't possible but were more useful alongside more traditional measures. The professional judgment shows us that um, there was probably several reasons why haddock and mackerel DNA were found close to the shore than would normally be the case. Um, there was a nearby fish market, so they would be preparing fish for sale or selling fish directly off the, off the harbour. Um, therefore, waste materials may have got into the sea from that process. Um, birds perhaps feeding out at sea, dropping their catch as part of the, um, the movement inland. 
or indeed defecating, having consumed either of these species. Um, there may be the presence of some human waste within the sea in these locations that um, may have included both of those species. Um, even possibly a girl having stolen someone's fish and chip supper from the, um, the harbour area as well. So it kind of proves that there is a need for professional judgment in all of these cases. Um, whilst we're undertaking different survey methods, comparing the two and using professional judgment as to why things might or might not be present is, is really important. So moving on to another, um, not case study per se, but another use of um, EZNA in the UK. Um, Great Crescent Newt Surveys, this is one of the major uses uh, in everyday um, life in, in ecology in the UK. Um, the window for traditional surveys is very much between April and mid-June, depending on the weather, but certainly finishing in mid-June um, when newts go out to uh, their terrestrial habitat. The EDNA window, however, does extend that survey window for two extra weeks, which means that we are able to service more clients um, for a longer period of time, particularly when those late instructions come in, which they inevitably do. So in this case, the survey window was missed due to a late instruction, um, but the EDNA results that we got in that two week window allowed for us to apply for a successful license application without having to delay for the following year's survey season. Um, there are some uh, bits and pieces that we need to take into consideration, um, one of which is, is this a reliable survey technique? Um, where populations are small, eDNA may miss presence of that species. Um, equally, it may be that if the samples are taken early in the season, that uh, great crested newts may not have made their way to the ponds by that stage in the year, um, and therefore the eDNA wouldn't be present. Um, there are also cases where great crested newts eggs have been found in ponds with negative eDNA um, when traditional services have been undertaken. So again, it comes down to um, it being a really handy, suitable alternative technique, but combining it with traditional survey techniques will still have a place in our assessments of this. Um, it also comes to the conclusion in both cases that when you take samples on a single day, they do represent a snapshot in time, um, as do in-person surveys. But when samples are taken at a regular basis um, and over a period of time, this can really give a great picture of the environment around us. So, as I said, largely applications have been related to testing water and for specific species, um, but what's next? This is where nature metrics come into um, play. We have been growing our relationship with nature metrics, who are one of um, the world's leading suppliers of eDNA testing. Um, we are working with them to help them to develop their techniques. We generally would be the ones to collect the samples and they would be the ones to test them and testing new techniques, which I'd like to pass on to, to Jo now, who will um, help to um, explain what's coming next and what's being done in the eDNA environment. Thank you so much, Emma, for that. Um, and uh, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, this is the agenda again, and we'll go to the next slide, please. And I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are at Nature Metrics just to start off to give you some context. So if we could have the next slide. So we were founded in, in 2014, uh, which seems like a long time ago now. And we are the world's largest commercial provider of environmental DNA services. Um, we are working with a, with a huge range of sectors, um, NGOs, uh, your classic conservation organizations, academia, so universities, uh, consultancies, WSP, of course. And um, we're working in a lot of different spaces. We're working in the offshore environment. We're working in mining. We're working in regenerative agriculture. And we've got uh, some really interesting projects coming through uh, related to the TNFD as well. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, despite appearances, I'm actually in the uh, the UK office at the moment, in just outside of London, in a place called Guildford. And uh, we have a um, North uh, North American office as well in Canada. 
and we leverage these two locations to you know get a pretty good coverage of the world we're about 140 employees and uh, i think this slide is slightly outdated because we're we seem to be working in um in more and more countries so i think we're probably on about 105 countries at the moment and counting thank you so uh, I'm going to talk about the, the sort of three uh, main types of eDNA that we're that we're using at the moment: the aquatic, the soils and sediments, and the the bulk invertebrates. Next slide, please. Okay, so essentially, what we're trying to do when we're when we're collecting the environmental DNA, the field component, is that we are trying to isolate DNA that animals have shed behind in the environment. This, in this case, in the water. We are trying to concentrate that DNA. We do that by filtering the samples. Um, and uh, we then want to stop the DNA from degrading. So we inject a preservative buffer into the filter. And then it's ready to be sent. The beauty of, these, um, of this process is that the, the equipment that we use is really cheap. It's very versatile. The most important element of it is sterility, making sure that we can't contaminate it with, with other sources of DNA. So, you know we're wearing gloves um, and all of the uh, all of the the equipment uh, the, the filter the syringe is all sterile and single use for that reason okay next slide please the analyses that we use that we use we can um, we can use primers uh, this is a really uh, uh, fantastic step in the evolution of DNA from a sort of single species approach to um, meta barcoding whereby we're we're basically uh, detecting simultaneously whole groups of organisms. We use specific primers that can amplify DNA. Um, and I'll talk about that now in the next slide. So when we get the, the samples back into the lab or when, when your samples arrive at a lab, uh, this is where the magic really starts to happen. We need to extract the DNA that we collected from all the other um, muck that might have been caught, the particulate matter. So we extract our DNA. We then amplify our, our group that we're interested in. So it might be fish, it might be vertebrates in general, maybe it's mammals or maybe it's freshwater insects. We can go into smaller, uh, we can look at microbes as well, so sort of smaller groups of organisms. And then we essentially use the PCA, polymerase chain reaction, to amplify that DNA. And the, the last step is the sort of bioinformatics, the essentially running what we have found against our reference database to see if there are any matches. Um, and that's, that's, that gives you a full list of what we've detected. Even if we do not have species on the reference database, we can still get a pretty good resolution to maybe genus or family level, because we can sort of, we can see that it's closely related, but not quite the same as the species that we have on file. So there's a really good application, even if we don't have everything on the reference database. Next slide, please. What does the data itself look like? This is a really nice example of the kind of outputs that you can expect. So the columns here are actually the samples. So we've got samples up to 30 and the rows of the taxa that were detected. Now, it's, it's sort of uh, perceived that environmental DNA is a binary yes and no presence absence approach. But you can see here that we do get relative abundance. So in this case, the, the size of the circle corresponds to the amount of DNA that's come from that taxa. Uh, using the European eel, one of my favorites, as an example, Anguilla, Anguilla, we can see that uh, it's pretty uh, it's pretty ubiquitous to all the samples, not as ubiquitous to the roach minnow, Rutilus, Rutilus, um, which is uh, the second from the bottom. We can see that was in all samples. But um, using the eel as an example, we can see that perhaps uh, the most amount of DNA was in uh, S11, sample 11, um, and there was no eel detected in sample 24. So, you know, we can't tell you if site 11 has one enormous eel in it or a uh, hundred smaller ones. But, you know, if we were to monitor that site year on year and suddenly it disappeared, we might be able to suggest that 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 some kind of activity has has stopped eel from being present in that in that area where where S11 was collected. OK, next slide, please. I'm going to flesh this out with, with a really nice case study of some work we did in uh, uh, Peru with WWF. So this was a huge area that they were looking at. And of course, they were very interested in these two uh, charismatic species, the pink river dolphin and the Amazon manatee. These are the species that get donations coming in from the public. 
but they are very hard to assess using conventional methods, survey methods. Uh, so in this approach, they decided to select 40 locations along this river network, a huge area, 1,500 kilometers of river, to almost 250,000 square kilometers of, of Amazonian jungle, um, about as logistically complex and challenging as you can get. And uh, they collected four um, samples at each of the 40 locations using 500 milliliters of water. Next slide, please. They were able to perform this mapping exercise where they could see that the dolphin on the left, four out of four samples, uh, um, the, the dolphin was pretty ubiquitous, you know, four out of four samples got a detection, whereas the uh, more elusive and much rarer Amazon manatee was clustered around this, um, this, this smaller area in the middle uh, with sort of um, a, only a few uh, sites getting four out of four detections for the species. Now, this is fantastic in terms of, you know, mapping species, species distributions over a huge spatial scale, but also identifying areas that are critical habitat for that species. Um, so really powerful stuff. Next slide, please. But not only that, because they used a, a vertebrate primer, they were actually able to get data on 373 other taxa of vertebrates. And we can see the split um, in the little, little chart down there at the bottom. So, you know, a huge amount of data to play with here um, and to really kind of prioritize species and, 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 um, and look for those biodiversity hotspots, where to focus res resources. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is a marine study. Now we can also use environmental DNA in marine ecosystems, and it's a, a really um, powerful approach here. I mean, trying to do assessments in the sea and the ocean is, is really challenging. Uh, this is a nice little project with the University of Sussex, and um, we can see that compared to a visual survey where they had a, a, a sort of baited trap with a, with a camera, um, that eDNA was a lot more efficient in terms of the um, amount of time taken to detect a species. Uh, on the left, you can see that four species were detected only with, um, with, with, with the uh, visual survey, um, four species that we didn't detect with eDNA, but actually we got a far greater detection of species um, with the eDNA, 51 species in all, and 21 species were detected using, using both methods. Um, okay, uh, next slide, please. A lot of the work that we're doing in the marine um, offshore environment is, is with renewable energy, with offshore wind. Um, and this is, you know, the, the uh, Western Europe has really um, been an early mover here, but this is starting to spread uh, globally. Um, there's a lot of interest, a lot of projects um, beginning in the APAC region. Uh, so, so we think this is going to be a really exciting sector. We know this is going to be a really exciting sector moving forwards. Uh, next slide, please. Soil eDNA. Soil eDNA is perhaps the, the earliest of the um, eDNA uh, applications. It's kind of where eDNA was, was discovered actually by some Norwegian uh, scientists if we look at Torsvik in, in way back in 1980. Um, next slide, please. So with soil DNA, the collection is slightly different, of course. We're actually, um, we're not using a filter here. We're taking, uh, we're taking samples, subsamples of, of soil, or we can use this for um, aquatic sediments too. And we are adding that soil to a, to a buffer solution again to preserve it. eDNA generally lasts anything from two hours to three days in the field. So, you know, we really need to make sure that these samples are preserved so that they can get back to the lab um, with viable DNA. Um, thank you, next slide. And then we have our, our, our lab process, the, the magic happens. Now, uh, the extraction process is obviously a little bit different. Uh, trying to extract DNA from, um, from soil is, is different from extracting DNA from a uh, filter, but uh, I actually don't know too much about the soil extraction process. But then we have the amplification of our group of interest um, and, the, uh, and, and then sequencing against the reference database. Thank you, next slide. And what are we really looking at? What are the main groups here? So soil fauna, this is the sort of uh, micro, um, mi microscopic uh, invertebrates, calembola and thing like that, things like that. And we also can look at the fungi and uh, the bacteria. So these three groups are, are, are what we're looking at with the soil microbiome, and they work very nicely together. We also have a metric, the, uh, the, fungal, to the fungal to bacterial ratio. You can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> 
Uh, this is just what the, the data output looks like again. So we have soil samples now in the columns and we have uh, bacteria taxa in the uh, rows across. Now you'll notice the resolution, we do not get to sort of species level um, as much as we do for the, uh, the larger organisms, the vertebrates and the insects. And this just purely reflects the, the sheer diversity of, of um, microbes and the fact that it's actually quite difficult to, uh, to barcode a, a microbial species um, to isolate them from one another. Okay, next slide, please. Um, what can we do with this uh, data that we get? Well, actually, uh, this is a nice example from the literature showing different tree cover, eucalyptus um, and, and pine, and looking at the bacterial community and the fungal community. We call these uh, um, uh, uh, graphs um, non-metric multidimensional scaling. That's not something I expect you to remember, but what it does is it means that we can, um, it, it essentially looks at community similarities. The closer together the dots uh, or the triangles, the more similar they are in terms of communities. And you can see that the different tree covers over different years, um, for the bacteria, they, they, they converge, the two, there's sort of two groups that converge, but for the fungal community, there's a clear distinction with uh, two clustered together on the right um, and two quite separate blue and red communities on the left. Okay, next slide, please. And this means that we can have uh, really good applications in terms of looking at different habitats, seeing how the uh, the the, um, uh, the microbiome varies, the soil communities of fungi and, and invertebrates, and in terms of restoration, how we can track recovery towards a reference or target condition uh, using microbes. Um, often the, the microbe, um, microbiome will reflect what what's happening with vegetation above ground. So we've also had a, a lot of applications here. Um, there are really viable applications in terms of looking at contamination and timescales of contamination and recovery. Okay, next slide, please. And this is the, uh, the fungi to bacterial ratio that I was talking about um, uh, a few slides back. Now, um, you can see the, the, the higher the, the fungi to the bacteria, the, um, it's a sort of metric for essentially soil integrity. Uh, fungi prefer um, uh, pretty um, uh, ecologically, um, ecologically better kind of a soil that's been less disturbed. Bacteria are far more opportunistic and will tend to dominate where there's been uh, sort of degradation activities. And we've got some really nice examples of literature down at the bottom of this slide too. Um, so you can see for the arable and the woodland example on the right, that the woodland has a higher fungal to bacterial ratio. Next slide, please. Uh, bulk invertebrate sampling. This is uh, essentially uh, taking away the, 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 the challenge of using conventional taxon taxonomic approaches to identify um, uh, invert insects that have been collected, either from freshwater environments or from uh, terrestrial landscapes using things like malaise traps or pitfall traps. Um, they are, of course, invertebrates are present in most ecosystems, so they can also be used as a proxy for, for broader biodiversity. The more insects we have in an area, the, the higher the ecological value of that area uh, as a quite a broad generalization. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so in this process, you collect your insects using a, a pitfall trap or uh, perhaps a malaise trap or a sweep net. Uh, try and make it standardized. You then um, uh, add a um, buffer solution to your invertebrates and then you can send them um, to the lab uh, whole or there's even uh, approaches that we can use where we add a, a solution that extracts the DNA from the uh, invertebrates and we use the solution to um, with, the, with the DNA in it to then mass barcode that. Next slide, please. Uh, I guess you could sort of wonder if, if um, invertebrate, bulk invertebrate sampling is really eDNA because, you know, we're using whole specimens, we're collecting the, the entire organism. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a bit of a sort of can of worms. Um, one thing that is uh, certain is that it can be slightly more complex in terms of exporting the samples internationally. You, we essentially do not know what specimens are there before we've done the metabarcoding analysis. So 
when you're asked to itemize what you're exporting, that can be a little bit of a challenge and, and certainly worth considering um, when looking at bulk invertebrate sampling. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we've got a few case studies where uh, invertebrates have been used to monitor habitat quality um, at, a, at a wind farm, and, and we're starting to use this as part of um, uh, NPI, so net positive impact, using uh, invertebrates in this way to essentially map um, the ecological integrity of a landscape and use that to detect uplift. Next slide, please. Uh, in this example, just out of 10 samples, the 144 unique taxa were identified to almost species level. Um, and this was really useful in terms of assessing condition of the grassland field margins um, for their habitat improvement plan. Uh, next slide. I think it's really important to, to focus on some of the, the key considerations for environmental DNA. And permitting is, is really quite high up on the agenda here. We, uh, um, if you are collecting your samples in, in a country and exporting them um, outside of that country to a lab to be analyzed, this is uh, way up there in the hierarchy. Uh, and it's really good to know exactly who you need to talk to and what permits you need to get the kits out of the country prior to collecting the samples. Um, uh, sorry, if we could go back, yeah. Um, another uh, key element as well is that uh, we, we're not getting population data, we're not getting kind of um, real abundance data, so we can't tell, um, you know, the age of specimens or, or the, um, uh, the sex ratio, or whether, whether we're getting females or um, uh, older individuals within the population, we can't get that data. As I said earlier, we wouldn't be able to tell you whether you had um, uh, an aging population of, of fish or, or um, lots of small little ones. So that can be a bit of a challenge. There's always a need to have some conventional uh, monitoring if that's what your question is, is asking. Um, the metabarcoding though is not entirely presence and absence. You know, we can we can uh, use those uh, relative abundances that we were that, that we had on the previous slides to get an idea of which tax are contributing the most DNA to a sample. And if we're tracking uh, these sites over time, you know, that can be a really good indicator of um, whether species are increasing in abundance or, or, or decreasing. Um, there, there are many uh, uh, limitations, such as you know, eDNA transport of your sampling in a stream. How do you know how far your DNA has traveled to where you're sampling at that stream? You know, are you detecting a salmon that is uh, a meter away or, or three, meter, three miles or, or 10 miles upriver? Um, you know, these, are, these are limitations that can be quite effectively mitigated by a robust design. Um, my dream is to one day sample a river system from source to sea, so from the, the very high mountain area down to the estuary, um, and you, could, you would then be able to actually kind of see where DNA is starting to be introduced into the system and actually map the distribution of fish species and other taxa along that river network. So we can do that on a smaller scale, of course, on a sort of project scale, by uh, seeing what's in a stream before it enters the site and seeing what's in a stream after it enters the site and seeing uh, and, and, and assessing what's, what's living on the site that way. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think it's really important to emphasize the, the, the pace at which this technology is moving. So if we can imagine that we uh, use that early example of bacteria from soil in 1980 in Norway, the first forensic use of DNA uh, was in 1986. Now, uh, forensic DNA from a crime scene is, is really almost no different from environmental DNA, just another, another form of environmental DNA, you might, you, you might think. Um, and then uh, the first single species detections in freshwater were using uh, um, invasive bullfrogs in 2008. 2012, this was uh, switched from a single species approach to metabarcoding, so simultaneously detecting whole groups of organisms. Quite an amazing um, advancement there. Uh, two years later, Natural England are accepting the use of environmental DNA for uh, great crested newts uh, that Emma introduced us earlier here in the UK. Another massive development. Um, 
and then we had uh, CRISPR in 2019 for single species detections, uh, more of a technological advancement that I'm not able to explain in any great detail. Um, and uh, yeah, we've been seeing a sort of steady uptake and wider acceptance of environmental DNA tools around the world um, in the last seven years. Uh, and at the moment, uh, one of the big sort of areas of excitement, one of the horizons that's moving quite quickly is air DNA. Um, uh, so that's actually taking, uh, sucking DNA out of the air um, onto a filter. Uh, next slide, please. So this was really sort of, it, the, the first paper below was in 2021. Um, we also worked on this uh, more recent paper uh, this year, um, detecting tropical bats by sampling air. Uh, this is a, a, a really exciting application. Again, it's, it's, it's not invasive. Um, we can leave uh, uh, essentially um, a sort of pump that's sucking air um, over a filter. Uh, to, to catch that um, those DNA molecules, eDNA molecules in the air, um, and then metabarcode them afterwards. A really exciting tool, uh, and and I like the fact that we used um, bats in this example because it shows a a real advancement from the approach that Emma mentioned earlier, where we would detect bat species from their feces. The um, uh, the PR slogan being species from feces. So I think the eDNA from air is a really uh, nice evolution of that towards something a little bit more sophisticated. If we could go to the next slide. And of course, we, we uh, have to imagine or we, we can imagine the amazing new locations that we could use this air DNA, uh, specifically arid environments. So um, areas of the Middle East, um, this photo was actually taken in Peru this year, so uh, areas of kind of high desert where water sources are, are, are really not that easy, easily available for sampling um, larger organisms. Uh, you know, we don't just detect um, in rivers and, and when we do our river and stream sampling, um, we're not just detecting the aquatic animals, but we're also detecting a lot of um, terrestrial uh, vertebrates whose DNA is washed into those systems. And that's just not really possible in these arid landscapes for obvious reasons, there's, there's no water. So to be, uh, to be able to detect eDNA from the air um, is, a, is, a, is a whole new area for us to explore. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to sort of end on this uh, idea of nature intelligence, which is really gathering a lot of momentum and this is the combination of, of all these technologies, uh, you know, bioacoustics, earth observation, GIS, drone surveillance, machine learning, um, environmental DNA, and of course, remote sampling to really equip, um, equip clients with the best uh, intelligence or well, data about their environment and about their biodiversity from which they can track uh, trends, um, of course, importantly either negative impacts but increasingly important nature recovery now tracking uh, the success of, of restoration using conventional methods is really really challenging um, and in order to rise to the challenge of biodiversity loss and creating successful interventions on which we can um, learn from and create an evidence base for uh, for that, that that drives increasingly uh, sophisticated and and good restoration activities and environmental practices, um, this nature intelligence will be a really important part of that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a really exciting project that we're working on, a sort of remote sampler, um, uh, working with Dartmouth Technologies. So essentially this can be deployed in a um, aquatic environment and uh, programmed to take eDNA samples on a, on a hourly, daily, weekly, I think monthly might be pushing it, basis. But yeah, a really nice advance here. Okay, next slide, please. So yes, that's the end from me. Uh, thank you so much for, for listening in. And um, please ask us uh, any questions that you might have. We've got a, um, a few questions that have come in um, so far. So the first is around the um, preservation of samples. 
Um, and the person has asked, how are the samples preserved and what is the best approach to this? Joe? That's a, that's a really good question and um, one that we get asked a lot. So perhaps the, the, the best practice is to freeze your samples uh, immediately after collecting them at sort of minus 40. Is that possible? No, in many situations it's not. We have buffer solutions that perform really well to maintain the quality of the DNA. It's way more versatile. So we're always uh, suggesting that you should go down the buffer route if the, the freezing technique is not, is not available. Um, uh, so I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Joe. Um, the next question is around meta barcoding and um, where we are with that and what are the limitations to the reference library that we have currently? Another really good question. So, um, yeah, depending on where you are in the world, the reference uh, library databases are going to be more complete. That often reflects um, how the uh, the wealth of that country. Um, you know, the Western Europe or, or group or, or region. You know, Western Europe has really good reference libraries for the species because they've been um, uh, heavily investigated. Same with North America. Um, the it, it can be harder but uh in um especially more mega diverse parts of the world um in the global south but in many cases we're still able to uh to get a something that we call an operational taxonomic unit for species so this is where we don't have it on a reference library but we uh but we know it's there and we can often get those to sort of genus level or family level um and you can detect those time and time again. So we could almost sort of assign them a, a species A1. We don't know what it is, but we know that it's within this genus. So we assume it might look like another species. And then you can also um, you can also barcode that species. You could do a campaign to try and, try and find a specimen using conventional methods and barcode it, add it to the reference database and it's, and it's there um, forever, I think, yeah. Super, thanks Jay. Um, what are the requirements for export of samples to um, your labs in the UK and uh, the US? So um, the easy way to answer that is that we, uh, we, we have a license to accept anything that arrives here in the UK, but in order to um, export them out of the country, there, there has to be uh, that each country will have its own requirements in that respect. So it can, it varies a lot from country to country. Some countries are more challenging than others. Indonesia is, is currently very difficult. Um, Brazil has been difficult, but we've, we've managed to sort of find a, um, a pipeline to, to work there and export samples, but it's really a case by case basis. On the plus side, if we have operated in that country before, we, we will have an idea of, of who you need to speak to um, to get the permits in order. Okay, super. Thanks, Joe. Um, okay, can, another question. This one's more about um, how long DNA uh, generally survives in different habitats. These questions are all fantastic. So, um, uh, very good question. You know, what would be the use of eDNA if eDNA persisted in the environment for a really long time, it would be almost uh, redundant because, you know, we would we can tell you whether it was a, um, whether the species had been there uh, sort of within the last couple of days or, or a year ago. The, the short answer is that uh, both um, uh, sunlight and heat degrade DNA quite quickly. In, in flowing waters, we would expect DNA to last anything from two to three days. Uh, the ecology of, of the environmental DNA, which is what this sort of the, the lifespan and the transport of DNA is, is, all, is all about, is a, a growing field of interest. I mean, there's, there's been lots of studies done. Essentially, um, if you're uh, working in a very cold environment, lots of ice, you know, that DNA is going to persist much longer. Um, there might even be a potential that your eDNA, if you're operating in like the Arctic, could be hundreds of years old if it's actually just been released by a melting glacier. So um, that there is a need for appreciation there, but as a, as a broad brush, I'd say kind of two to three days um, is how long DNA lasts. In the tropics, lots of sunlight, very hot, uh, probably a little bit shorter. <laughs> 
Okay, thanks. That's great. Um, so in terms of the airborne easing, we've had a question in, I've seen from Canada. Um, how long has that been um, being tested, um, the example with the bats, and um, has it been tested in Canada? I had a really bad feeling that someone would ask a question about that because I, I actually I actually do not know enough about the specifics of that project. But please do send me an email on my email address below, and I can I can get an answer for you or direct you to a person who can who can give you a good answer there. But thanks for the question. I think it is uh, the bat stuff is relatively new from our our knowledge of it. Um, but yeah, we'll get you a quest, We'll get you an answer if you just uh, drop an email through to either Sharon, who's organised this, um, or the two two email addresses on the screen. We'll get you we'll get you an answer to that question um, as soon as we can. Um, so uh, we've got another one uh, around abundance and density. I think we've you've covered this a little bit, Joe. But um, how can eDNA be used to calculate that sort of abundance and den density of species within environments. Yeah, that's that's a really that's a tough one. Uh, quantitative DNA, it's something that we're that we're looking at. Um, it, it has a, a whole range of challenges, not least because some species are more dirty than others in terms of emitting DNA. Um, so fish and amphibians, they have a slime layer. They they um, they release a lot of environmental DNA into the environment. Uh, and also, we have to remember that, especially in aquatic ecosystems, spawning events, um, it's a pretty uh, DNA-intensive process, so um, it's, it's likely to get distorted quite quickly. Uh, it's, um, I mean, I think we're still a couple of years away from, from getting, you know, uh, confident quantitative DNA, but it's definitely happening. I'm sorry I can't provide a better answer than that, but also what I was saying about um, year on year change. If you are, uh, you've got a good number of samples for a, a lake um, and you're sort of, and, and that provides like a baseline, you can kind of track uh, increases in, in relative abundance for certain species or decreases for them as well and use that as a rough proxy. Super, thanks. That does nicely lead on to the next question. Um, can the eDNA be utilized for ecological and species conservation? I think you've partly answered that, Joe. Um, in that, doing samples over periods of time will help you to work out what's there now, what's there um, in future years of, of monitoring as well. So it can be used to um, to either track a baseline for what's there currently, um, or to uh, track the species abundance over time as a, as a habitat develops. Um, do, have you got anything to add to that, Joe? Yeah, I mean, some of the really, really exciting applications for environmental DNA are where you have, um, you're looking for populations of, um, of like, of species. You're looking for wild populations of, of um, very threatened, very rare uh, species. So perhaps you have a frog that's, you've only got some specimens in captivity and you want to go back into its natural environment and try and look for those um, remaining remnant populations. You know, that's a really good application of environmental DNA. Super. Um, another one uh, around specifics of um, pollinators, so bumblebees, solitary bees. Um, is it possible to sample those pollinators with eDNA or metabarcoding? It's a good reference library for this group in the UK down all the way to species level. That's a that's a good question, um, Emma, and something I'm not entirely sure about. I think that we can um, we can get a pretty good idea of because we can get to genus or family level. Um, we can get a pretty good sort of number uh, of um, even using OTUs, and I think the resolution in the UK is pretty good for pollinators. There's been a lot of uh, investment uh, in the science by the scientific community and the agricultural community as well in identifying pollinators. So. Um, I can be reasonably confident that it would work well, but uh, um, I don't know for sure. So yeah, please feel free to reach out and I can get you a good answer. Okay, super. Um, so there's um, a couple more questions coming in. Um, how do you know if an endangered species uh, is in the DNA library? 
you um, you send us an, an email or um, and we can run what we call a, a gap finder analysis. So uh, usually we can feed in whole lists of species, but we can certainly do it quite quickly for an individual species. Uh, you know, you can also have a little look yourself on things like Bold and the NCBI um, uh, databases, maybe G um, GBIF as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that answers the question. Super. Um, so, have you got plans um, to publish your results in peer-reviewed journals for the eDNA methods? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we 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 work with um, a range of different uh, sectors, and and we work with academia as well, and we do publish um, our findings quite often. So. Yeah, we're always looking to try and and get a get peer-reviewed publications, and we do have quite a lot of materials that we put out ourselves as well, um, discussing kind of our, our our new tools and and how they've been applied. Super. There are um, a couple of questions around um, these investigations making it possible for monetary laws to protect the natural environment, and also another one's relatively linked to this about. Um, whether the effects of um, ecological DNA studies um, and reporting would that be considered with legal implications around the environmental impact assessment of projects? Um, so it's twofold, really. It's, I think it's really about the uh, the laws and um, protection of species and and the legal implications around environmental impact assessment. Whether these things can be relied on for those kind of projects. Yeah, that, that's a really good question, um, and I think that it's it's uh, it's going to vary, isn't it, from from country to country? And it's we're still actually in quite an early stage of sort of um, educating environmental protection agents, agencies and and um, other uh, regulators on the tools. I think it's it's going to move quite quickly. We have uh, there's there's many governments have active um, working groups discussing how they can incorporate eDNA into regulatory frameworks. Uh, we work um, a lot with uh, clients operating um, to get, you know, to meet lender requirements, uh, such as IFC6 um, and the EBRD's PR6 uh, and, and those kind of wider equator principles. And often they're just trying to demonstrate that they're going above and beyond to to show to the regulator that they've taken into account um, the biodiversity at the site where they want to where they want to work, um, where they have a project. So uh, there's, I think it's gonna, you know, it's hard to track where each government is and what they're accepting. Um, and then we, when we go to places like the uh, United States, each state might have its own um, view on this uh, or, or legal framework around it. But uh, I think we we are gathering momentum there. Um, for sure. Super, thank you. So we'll take one last question um, before we wrap up this session. Um, what are the real advantages um, in cost and time to projects? I'm happy to take part of this question. Um, in terms of time, I've mentioned previously with, um, with this, it does remove um, some of the survey seasons um, that you you adhere to in some in some respects uh, with regards to taking that extra it's obviously generally takes less time to do these sampling and with some of the techniques that Joe's talking about um, we have automated collection of um, some data so that obviously reduces the person time going to um, to site I think it also helps to confirm what's present gives you a, a much better idea of what's in the in the environment that you're looking at um, like in uh, Joe's marine example with so many more species that um, were found uh, in the eDNA sampling than in the in the visual sampling um, Joe anything to add before we wrap up yeah I've got a, a, um, a sort of an anecdote actually when I was doing my postdoctorate in Colombia I went on a university collecting trip to a place called um, San Jose Guaviare which is a ecosystem called the Llanos it's kind of hinterland between um, Am um, Amazon Amazonian jungle and a kind of open Pantanal like grassland we were trying to collect specimen fish there and we were using nets and deploying them and every time I put the nets down and we caught a nice fish 
it would get attacked by piranhas. And by the time I got to it, you know, you could hardly identify the fish. We then had, with the fish that we did manage to get in a sort of decent state, we then had to try and get them out of the jungle um, without them going off. And we're talking about temperatures of 35 degrees Celsius, not just the big fish, but all of the small fish as well, so that we could identify them in the lab with microscopes and everything that we couldn't bring to the field with us. Um, so certainly in that kind of mega diverse ecosystem where you've got potentially hundreds of species of fish and you're in the field for quite a short time and you're sort of collect, you're trying to get as much data as possible, the, the benefits of a molecular approach are, are, are um, really evident. But more generally, you know, there's the ease at which you can just collect water compared to having to um, find species. I, I think it's, I think it's um, uh, very optimistic with the increasing scope required for um, uh, species surveys in terms of the species that they're including, that we can, um, that our teams are expected to be able to ascertain what's in the environment during the sort of short period of time that they're there looking for things and trying to identify them to species level. Super, thanks Joe. Um, thank you to all who have been able to join us today. Um, thank you to Joe for um, joining me and presenting and um, and helping me to share the, the upcoming um, future prospects of this area and um, our relationship with uh, with Nature Metrics. So thank you to everyone for joining um, and um, hopefully see you on the next uh, Global Snack and Learn webinars that are upcoming in the calendar. Thanks all. Thank you, Emma. Thank you everyone for joining.